But, well, apparently we are even saving up some time. Now, on to chronic pain, which is a crucial topic here on this Congress, because talking about OA and joint conditions, well, it not it related to pain? And then chronic pain, because we're talking about a chronic condition. We're looking for therapies, for solutions. Some of them might be drug-based, some might be non-drug-based. And we'll be talking about them both now. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Luis Miguel Torres, president of the SEMDOR Association and the pain unit at the Puerta del Mar Hospital, that's in Cadiz. So welcome, Dr. Torres. So you have a presentation with you? So let's see. OK, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank Wafi for their invitation for the second time. Uh, even more so, considering the cooperation that WAFI and the Multidisciplinary Pain Association, Spanish Association, is having on how to improve the situation for this condition, which is complex, and that unfortunately, as we have seen in the previous discussion, we are not having really OA drugs that would help us change arthritis, that would stop it, and that would remove it. So I think that these trials are good news. Because the problem with pain, it begins with some acute pain and inflammation. I'll try to keep simple my explanation. And this creates a pain that if prolonged in the periphery, it ends up becoming a chronic pain, way more complex, way more difficult, because there it leads to an issue on the in the brain structure. So an inflammation or a trauma, as often these are, activates a cell releasing some substances that lead to pain and inflammation. So a vicious circle is created so that little by little the joints are destroyed in the case of osteoarthritis. So in a nutshell, a peripheral injury that ends up becoming a condition in the very brain of the patient other than the pain and the inflammation that takes place in the joints. This is what's known as arthritis and as you know, if you suffer from this, other than pain, there is rigidity, heat, mobility issues, which also make the patient moving less and having a greater impact on joints, and so we move into yet another vicious circle. Further stimulation of these substances, further issues, further pain. There are several types of OA, but then we will focus on this one specifically, osteoarthritis. We have some other infectious arthritis, uh, and then we have OP, osteoporosis, as the loss of bone mass that will make for the prolongation of this condition and where many joints are, are involved, hip, knees, back, close to all the joints. So since we don't have any treatment against the arthritis, like you would take a pill and this would all go away, we need to focus on alleviating in as much as possible the condition. First thing that the patient should know is to tell them what their issue is. Because often patients go and visit their doctor in order to be healed. But when they cannot be healed, Frustration appears. How come I cannot be healed? So first thing we need to tell them is the true nature of the condition, how come it was caused, so that they really know what we want to do with the treatment to control the risk factors such as obesity, such as poor diet, so to decrease in as much as possible the burden on the joints, their activities, the cold or heat that we 
my years. And one of the best therapies, also one of the most economical ones, is physical exercise. No one should stop exercising, even with an OA. It might be some adapted, customized exercise. But lack of mobility will lead to a rigidity in the joints, in the involved joints, and therefore a vicious circle with an increase in the inflammation and pain. Therefore, physical exercise, no matter which, doesn't have to be specific. It could be swimming, could be many more things. It must be a physical exercise that they like, that they can do, and they can do it on an ongoing basis, on a daily basis. So it's better to walk for five minutes than to rest for five, and then rather than just doing long stretches, short stretches, but going on throughout the day. And this is crucial because we're lacking a specific treatment. We talk about pain killing or pain killers. A scale was created based on the type of pain and we go up a step, a level. We start with NSAIDs or anti-inflammatory drugs, and then we can even reach, in the most severe cases, to opioids with the resulting supervision. This scale is slow, and when the patient has a very acute, intense problem, we propose a faster method, the lift, so we can go to higher doses or more potent drugs if needed and reduce it quickly as if it were a lift other than stairs. The basic treatment entails NSAIDs, non-steroidal drugs and paracetamol. It can be on topical use in the form of a cream or an ointment with less adverse effects or orally or intravenously. As you can see, we have made great strides in the development of these drugs. Some are called general ones, non-selective drugs affecting the whole bodies with some advantages and some disadvantages. Here you can see the names of them. And then they invented some selective, such as selecoxib and coxib, you may know some of them that have less secondary or after effects maintaining their efficacy. By and large, these agents modify the pain by reducing the inflammation. In any event, we need to keep in mind that these drugs are not 100% safe. On the contrary, many self-medicate with these drugs as if this was not important and their safety margin is narrow. Sometimes they produce many adverse effects, and even if they do not create dependency, they could cause important problems in general in the cardiovascular system, in the gastrointestinal system, or in the renal system. What these agents cause is analgesia. They remove pain by means of mechanism I'm not going to explain. They produce anti-inflammation. It can also be used as an anti-rheumatoid. They have effect with fever and also in the co coagulation of blood. So, these are complex agents, which, even if many of us would take them daily without medical prescription, since they're very popular, cheap, and efficient, we need to bear in mind that the chronic intake and prolonged intake should always be supervised by a doctor. We know ketoprofen, ibuprofen, it's been recognized it's taken without a prescription, it's taken for many different types of pain, basically when there is inflammation. Here you can see the usual doses and some of the risks common to all. Basically, gastrointestinal problems because it can cause ulcers and some renal complications and hypersensitivity or allergia complications. There are others other than these more common ones such as uh, indomethacin, ketorolac and diclofenac. These are only to be given under medical supervision because they can lead to important adverse effects. And some of the new ones with less adverse effects in the gastrointestinal system, but with some problems in the cardiovascular system, such as a co melicoxam, coxib, they are effective as painkillers, as anti-inflammatory drugs, but when they're not as safe as we thought they would have been in the past. Here you can see the dose. For most of these drugs, just in case you would like to check this later, Dr. Vergez will have this presentation. It will be made available to him. And then the risks that we mentioned, 
in the gastrointestinal system leading to bleeding, cardiovascular system and renal system leading to renal insufficiency. This is especially important in elderly patients in the summer when little, if there is little water intake and it's very hot and these patients are taking anti-inflammatory drugs, it could lead to important renal failure. These are the adverse effects I already mentioned and now some brief remarks on the most potent drugs that we have. We can, can we treat osteoarthritis with opioids? Yes, if we're not able to remove the pain otherwise. But this is a drug that is very potent, very powerful, and has complications associated. The easiest to use is tramadol. It is used in combination with some NSAIDs, such as paracetamol, many patients take it. It's rather safe. These are some of the commercial names. But in some patients, it could lead to nausea, vomiting, and because of that, these drugs must be used only under medical control, especially if we're talking about long-term treatment. Even more so, if we're talking about the potent painkillers for the most severe cases, such as back pain, intensive back pain, that does not remit with paracetamol or ibuprofen. In some patients, you should take briefly drugs such as morphine, tapentadol, which are much more powerful and has much more complicated mechanisms of action. Or diomorphone, hydromorphone, that help to reconcile sleep if the patient has a very intense pain and this pain does not go away with the, the painkillers. Hydromorphone could be a good solution. And tapentadol, the latest opioid that we've that we have on the market reserved for patients with very intense pain that does not go away with conventional t treatment only in short periods of time it has a double mechanism of action which means that its morphine effect opioid effect is lower and its painkiller effect is greater through a mechanism of action that is complex and i will not explain right now but just for you to know there are two mechanisms of action and that is why a lower dose can be given of this opioid component of the product, making it safer. It is a simple molecule from a chemical point of view. It has less adverse effects than morphine. And in the case of prolonged therapies, severe OA in combination with NSAIDs and other drugs, these are interesting drugs. And then we have other options aside from the painkillers that we mentioned, NSAIDs, paracetamol, and opioids. There are other drugs called chondroprotectors. OAFI has done a lot of work and they have put a lot of effort to be able to prescribe these drugs, such as chondroitine sulfate, glucosamine. These are not specifically specific drugs for OA, but they do seem to help for joint damage to develop more slowly so that they can live a more normal life. There's also a capsaicin cream applied to the joint. In some cases, can be efficient. And we saw what we saw in the previous presentation, infiltration, joint infiltration. Dr. Batet will probably get into that. We do less infiltrations with corticoids and more with regenerating agents. And in this case, regenerative medicine, I think, will pave the way for patients with OA to resolve in the future and have a new regenerated joint with the own stem cells of the patient. In conclusion, for the pharmacological treatment, as everything in medicine, first, we need a correct diagnosis, a suitable one. It's not the same in psoriatic or infectious OA. The hip is not the same as the back. We need a correct diagnosis. We cannot say that the family has a lot of OA and I will just follow a treatment without knowing my case. So we need also suitable follow-up and monitoring. This is a chronic disease. It will probably won't abandon us until we stop. So we will need to coexist with it until the new therapies arrive. So proper monitoring by the primary care unit, rheumatologist or others is necessary. Physical exercise, also key. When one say, says they wake up in the morning and everything aches, I say, the day they wake up and nothing hurts, think twice and make sure you're alive. You might be in a coffin because if you don't get up,
everything hurts. Then you start moving around, and the physical exercise will delay the process of arthritis of OA. So it's especially important to do physical exercise, manual therapy, yoga, tai chi, so on and so forth. Interventionist techniques are getting better. Dr. Bateta will refer to them. And the drugs, when we need to take them, when there is no other choice, should be supervised by the doctor. Minimum doses and only for the time needed. Thank you very much. We need to take good note of what Dr. Torres said. If in the morning nothing hurts, just double check your life. You just said that new therapies hopefully will come soon. Why is there this feeling that there are no drugs, new, no new drugs against pain? Why is this the case? Unfortunately, if we have a look at the two large groups of drugs, the NSAIDs, humanity has known them from a tree for many years ago, and the opioids has been known for thousands of years too. For some reason, pharmacological progress on something new is something that we do not see. Some, as some trials have been made, but we cannot find the molecule. So the pain system has something to preserve our integrity, but it's difficult to find new mechanisms of action. I trust that instead of new drugs to get rid of the pain, we'll find new drugs, such as the trial that we saw earlier, to regenerate the joint. When we were able to regenerate the, car the cartridge, the cartilage in the, in the hygiene, we can much better. And I think we will make much more progress with regenerative medicine rather than with new painkillers, which are just modifications of the same molecule. We saw 20 NSAIDs, but they're all the same modified, some are short, some are longer. There's nothing new though to it. And the morphine is the same. There are slight modifications of what the same molecule, but the essence of the mechanism of action is the same. So let's trust more on regeneration than on the painkillers, which are palliative care. Mr. Torre, thank you very much. Don't go too far, doctor, because you will also join us in the next table. And also with us is Dr. Karma Batet Gabarro, doctor in medicine, specialist in anesthesiology and resuscitation, head of the clinical unit of the pain division of the Moses Brogi Hospital Complex. She's the vice president of the Spanish Association, Multidisciplinary Association of Pain, acknowledged in the US, in Europe, and Dr. Batet, welcome. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. My daily activity is that of providing anesthesia. I'm an anesthesiologist and I've been managing pain for many years. I would like to focus my presentation on what we do at the pain units and what our approach is. Where do we place interventionist treatments and why? This is a broad presentation. This is a general slide. When we speak at the end of a Congress, some things have been already said, but these are important things nevertheless. The main cause of our pain is because we generate an inflammatory state. This is the first thing that happens, and then it is conveyed through the nervous system. But the first thing that happens is the inflammation. Our body controls the state that we are in at all times, and it does it through different means. We have visceral information, we have the emotional stress in the prefrontal cortex, and the entire musculoskeletal system through the spinal ganglia. All of this meets in a neurological center called 
the solid the tractus nucleus solitarius. There it is integrated and processed with a response. This response is the sympathetic system and the immunologic system. Some people have a permanent inflammatory state because they suffer from diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, intestinal diseases, degenerative diseases, and even depression. And all of this, in addition to trauma or another disease, brings about a severe inflammation. Therefore, we're talking about a deregulation of our immunological and metabolical system. So a very clear message that we should take away with us is that pain is a biopsychosocial alteration. It is a biopsychosocial disease, biological because they are genetic, structural, nutrition, no factors, lifestyle, age, S social because the stress influences or everything that has to do with the employment relationship, the social relationship, frustration, the school, the family, and psychological because there are emotions, perceptions, sensitivities, beliefs, hobbies. All of this influences chronic pain. It is a part and parcel. Pain is never isolated. Therefore, interventionist treatments are one more leg of a whole treatment process. They are very important, but they are part of a treatment process that must follow the stages that we just said, pharmacological attention, care, psychological support. And an important part of it is the interventionist treatment. Why do we apply an interventionist treatment? Because there is a dysfunction, and this dysfunction occurs in a joint, in a cartilage, in a ligament. Without this dysfunction, we wouldn't apply it. When do we apply it? We apply it when other treatments sometimes do not work. The therapeutic scale or staircase that Dr. Torres referred to, when an oral drug is not tolerated by the body or produces intolerance or generates allergy or causes such intense pain that we cannot walk, we cannot think, we cannot exercise, we need to stop it somehow so that later we can continue with a conservative treatment. And this needs to be tied in with other treatments. How and where are they applied? They are applied in suitable centers, not in any clinic, with a regulated asepsia, with approved people, with the knowledge of the physiological situation of the patient, with the medical record, knowing the allergies, the type of coagulation pattern, etc. What are the most used? We've already mentioned many. I will mention them now. I'll detail them later. We've seen anesthetic drugs, acid hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid, platelet-rich plasma, stem cells. But there are others, important ones, that can help us, such as acupuncture, ozone, and then we block the nerves involved. So we desensitize, not 100%, a specific joint so that it doesn't hurt so much, so that we can move it. And if we move it, osteosynthesis is better, and muscle tone needs to be mass, strength, and functionality acts better. Then there are other treatments less followed, as Dr. Said, Torres said, with corticosteroids. And then there's radiofrequency, which I shall explain in detail later. The most widely used processes are hyaluronic acid that was mentioned this morning. The aim is to reestablish the synovial liquid when the AO reduces. Blood products. PRP. In addition to assisting in coagulation, platelets have other factors and components that help us in other functionalities. They have a strong anti-inflammatory 
power, for example. That's why we use these drugs. It is important that these two that we just mentioned be used, especially at the early stages of an OA. When an OA is broadly in present, it does not have the desired effect. Mesenchymal stem cells, there are two types. Why do we call them stem cells? Because they are pluripotential. Through them, we can generate other tissues. And that is why they are used in cancer treatment. They especially come from two areas. The embry embryonary stem cells, some people freeze them through the umbilical cord. It can be frozen, but this is a system that we will not deal with now. And the stem cells of the adult, which is a vascular stromal fraction that can come from either the bone marrow or from the fatty tissue. The bone marrow is extracted. It is measured how many cells there are, and they are cultured. So it's a genetic treatment because they are increased, cultured. If we take 2,000, we try to make sure that we can that there can be 40 million cells and then they're implanted. That's why mesenchymal cells are so important when they are drawn from the bone marrow. However, this can only be done through a clinical trial. The ministry will only give permission to do so through clinical trials and there are just very few centers with these capabilities. They need to ask for permission and their results tend to be very good. And then we have the stem cells in the adipose system that also increase because they are centrifu centrifuged for one hour and they can be used in joints, tendons, maybe there are two million cells. We do not have a clear demonstration in the so-called medicine based on publications. It has not been demonstrated, but experience of doctors shows that it is working quite well. I was in this morning's presentation, so I would say I heard the patient speak. It was impactful. So trust is important. If the person treating us has an experience and recommends something according to our type of pathology, it will work and we will believe it. There are other kinds of treatments, such as radiofrequency. In this case, we treat the nerves that will give sensitivity to a part of our body. For example, a joint, be it in the backbone, on the knee. Radiofrequency can be of two kinds. Thermal, when we destroy the sensitive nervous fiber through the tip of the needle, the cannula, we generate friction in the electrolytes. We don't heat it up, but we friction the circulant tissue, and this generates temperature. And sometimes it destroys part of the nervous fiber. With time, it regenerates. And another radio frequency type is pulsated. It creates an electrical field that alters conduction through a nervous fiber that is very fine without myelin cover but, or coating, but it provides sensitivity. I'm referring to A, delta, and C fibers. And now we go into a series of slides with images. For example, let's start with the backbone with the spine. The spine is attached to one vertebra on the posterior aspect. This posterior aspect, which we call facets, is like a knee. There's a menisque a coating, an encapsulation, and it is dowed with the sensitivity caused by small fibers, a small fiber from the main nerve, which we call the posterior medial nerve and it will enervate these facets, these joints. And these joints are often deformed with OA. 
As years go by, these joints become deformed. And with the passing of the years, the disc dehydrates. There are less discal hernia, but the disc dehydrates and comes down. And there's hypertrophia of these joints that could compress the nerve. In this image obtained from an MRI, with a longitudinal cut, we can see the joints enlarged. We can see the dehydrated discs. Sometimes they are such dehydrated that the vertebra on top and the one underneath do this here, which is whiter. That is an edema. That is an inflammation. And this, since it receives the flow of blood, this disc is filled with bacteria and it produces small infections within the disc. And wherever possible, we will go inside and we will administer an antibiotic or bactericidic substances. We do not Im improve the disc, but we are able to reduce the pain caused by this inflammation. And sometimes it is difficult to reach this aspect of the cells. And then there's this part which we can see enlarged. It is deformed. We can see the nerve providing enervation, and we treat it with radio frequency especially. For example, here, the radio frequency needs to be well done for it to work. We do it with radiology. I received radiological training, and that's the way I do it, unless we're talking about a back, and this one is not too bad. So in this case, we could also use a scan, a CT scan. An ultrasound, excuse me. Sometimes we focus on the joint. It's this one here. And here we can use PRP or stem cells. Also, sometimes we treat the nerve, which is compressed by the facet, also the disc. And in one same patient, we treat the nerve L5 and S1, and at the same time, the discs. This photograph, this image here, can be used to show that this is not a surgical intervention, but we do need whatever is necessary for there to be strict abscesia. In the cervicals, the same thing happens. Sometimes we treat the cervical joints, which are very small, tiny, but they produce a lot of pain. And sometimes we go to the nerve that enervates these joints. In this case, we can see the patient. We also radiate ourselves. We do so because we believe this is the best for the patient and because we want to treat the patient. And as you know, as we said this morning, the system does not provide the desirable response, but we do what we can to provide all the necessary means to provide a suitable treatment. For example, these joints in radiology, we need to go to the exact location to treat it, and that is why we do different, we take different images. This is, there is sometimes a very acute pain at the end of the cervicals that occurs because of atlantoaxial compression between the first and the second vertebrae. So sometimes we need to go here and do a blockage and radio frequency within this joint. We place the patient in a prone position that, or in a supine position. That's the way I do it. Then other times, there is pain in the occipital. There are nervous fibers that come from the spine. So we go to the greater occipital nerve. Sometimes we infiltrate this part of the espinos at the end of the first vertebrae because it's rich in ligamentous insertions. And other times, this is another stem, mesenchymal stem cell treatment. In the cervicals, the cervical disc.
Y pasando ya a otras estructuras, por ejemplo... Now on to different structures, such as the shoulder. Often there are several supraspinal pains that often leads to an injury. And here, if this is in the shoulder joint, we have a tri-compartment blockage so that the, within the glenohumeral space and then posteriorly in the clavicle with the acromia. And with the supraspinal, we also go to the suprascapular nerve. We can take here acute pain for any person for few months and later with time it but at first it it is a disabling pain and then in some other type of joints such as the foot and this is an arthritis and an inflammation we use rich platelet plasma and sometimes hyaluronic acid and we do it two or three times in the joint and then in some other areas such as the hip and this is for instance a great hip yet it's painful so you can have either an infiltration with the products I mentioned or RF but when the arthritis degeneration is significant often you have to go for surgery if possible and sometimes there is a pain, a posterior pain, such as the one here at the sacroiliac joint. OA, and I'm telling you this because it, we're in the catchment area in my hospital, 450,000 people, usually is knee, foot, hip, and they are basically focusing on these areas. This is a joint which is much painful on this part, and here we infiltrate PRP, plasma-rich platelet, because platelet-rich plasma. Sorry, because this is usually done only in areas as allowed by the ministry, and it has a significant cost. So I will not be talking about this because this is not a therapy that we usually do. I've done it every now and then because I'm being called to, but then for very specific groups. And this is a joint, the knee joint. Here you can see the number of innervations that you can find in the knee. The knee is a major joint with many areas involved, nerves, ligaments, the muscle strength, several things. And we sometimes go to the geniculated nerves, one on top and one on the bottom, two on top and one on the bottom, and this slightly decreases pain. And this is sometimes done within the joint. You can use PRP, hyaluronic acid, stem cells, or sometimes radio frequency, such as here. And Often, the knee causes so much pain, even after a surgery, that we go to the L4 spinal nerve and we block the spinal ganglia, the nerves going to this joint. And I wanted to remind here that an intervention is a significant part of the treatment unless you take into consideration all the other aspects we are not doing that we are not having a only intervention we have all the areas in mind and i think that this is something that we have clearly learned and hopefully this has been useful to you all thank you Muchas gracias. thank you very much dr batet question when should we tell a patient that they should go to a pain unit? Well, pain units started 
with painkiller units, with anesthesia, because we were trained and we would reach nerve groups that doctors or some other specialists were not able to reach, or it w there was a significant learning curve that we had already gone over. And it's been really useful in Spain and in other countries because pain units have raised awareness on the need to treat for pain. And as we have learned, we have become multidisciplinary. Now is no longer treated by a single specialist. There are several specialists treating pain. The problem in Spain is that the specialties are so much in silos that often we do not treat the pathological process. So the anesthesiologists, the physical therapies, the GP with proper referral, they should all be treating that patient anyway on my specialty, if I may. We are, have good knowledge on pain. We manage our patients quite well. You know that sometimes it's not that easy with the system, but we know where we are. And if we have a patient, we study them so much that we know how to take care of them. And this is fundamental. We need to know where we are. I mean, the treatment, that's easy to us. Some things are not uh, incorporated into the system we have, but we know what needs to be done. And this is why pain units are true guarantors these days that the treatment must be done right and can be done right. And to conclude, one thing that caught my attention, not sure if it's because you are a reanimator, an anesthesiologist, but you have just mentioned, and this is something that we discussed before, you said that you were seeing in this panel of patients how they were struggling for a better life. Yes, this was something that I felt really close because this is something I can feel on a daily basis. And here there are no two sides. It's not doctors versus patients. We are all patients and we can all contribute. And I think that this is the take-home message in my mind. Another thing is that for a doctor, or for a drug, sorry, to have an impact, we need to have some trust. The patient-doctor trust cannot be broken. And we have heard how, well, this is how it is, and, and sometimes people do not respond well. We know that. We know where we get it wrong, and we fight for that. But from the organizations, um, that's something to bear in mind, because the change will come bottom up and not top down. Dr. Torres, Dr. Batet, I would like to thank you for your presentations. And let me say that now we can later discuss, but both Dr. Torres and Dr. Batet are helping us very much at UAFI, way beyond the doctor's duty, because we doctors, we are also human and we have our feelings and if this is a vocational profession. So, first of all, thank you very much for being here for these wonderful presentations. We will always be supporting Sendor and the pain professionals because these pain units are so much needed. And the scientific level and your quality and your interest is extraordinary. So I know 
I understand, Dr. Batet, and it happens to me. This is something that we often see in and that we it's like we're under attack, but we know you know that you are fighting against the situations and with overbooking. So just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Also to the rest of the speakers, because I know that you've left your daily job now coming here on a for free. Gracias, Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.